Uh, so up next, we have uh, Vanita Parchuri from Dartmouth College. So give her a welcome. Hello. So hi. Um, questioning 42. So why are we questioning the answer to the life universe and everything? Because when we talk about a few attacks that seem to happen uh, in the wild, we attribute this term called social engineering to those. Um, it's just something we say when people do things and people deceptively get into systems um, by conning or deceiving other people or just conning the system, basically. Um, that's kind of what social engineering seems to be right now. Uh, so yes, we have the answer. We know what went on. We know what people did. We know how they got in. But what's the question? as deep thought gave out the answer and as people were trying to ponder the question. So what is it that we're trying to solve now? So what are we trying, where's the engineering in social engineering? So we, we, we just say this, but what does it really mean? And if it is engineering, in fact, then why are we just saying this is something that someone with some charm and tact can pass through a system? But where's the engineering part? That's not engineering. So what is all of this? So that's what this is going to be. Let's just dive in. So um, at a very macro level, the talk is going to be uh, about some case studies uh, that happened in the wild, uh, basically some attacks that were supposedly called social engineering attacks that happened, um, that were widely publicized, but nothing really seems to be done about those things yet. Um, and then get the lowdown of the theory, basically what that means, engineer the, uh, what aspects of uh, aspects that could be engineered from the data, basically, whatever case studies that happen. And then um, what I propose um, is a way of visualizing this so-called problem. Um, and right now, we don't even know what this problem is. As I said, yes, social engineering exists, but what is the problem? that social engineering is being targeted at. Is it identity theft? Maybe. Um, is it uh, theft for financial motivations? Yes, in some cases. But we also see that in a lot of cases, these are not the primary motivators at all. So in which case, how do we do the risk metrics? Um, what is this problem called then? So that's kind of interesting to look at. So that's what we're going to talk about. So yes, these were the case studies that I'm talking about, where um, in 1995, uh, the most expensive domain name till date ever, sex.com, which was sold for $13 million in 2010, I believe. Um, the domain ownership was transferred um, by a malicious person just sending a fax to the domain registrar. Yes, I see people giggling there. Uh, all it took for the transfer of ownership for the most expensive domain name ever was a fax, which was in fact poorly written because, <laughs> yes, because the person was a hacker. He did not have formal education. Uh, he did not go to school. There were a lot of uh, spelling and grammatical errors, which should have been obvious, but the registrar just didn't care, uh, which we will get into it, uh, the policies and uh, the culpability of registrars. Um, so yes, that was 1995. And in 2013, Metasploit.com uh, apparently got hacked um, the same way. Not hacked, yes, but the domain was hijacked for a brief time. HD Moore, uh, I believe, tweeted about it saying, hacking like it's the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> so almost two decades later, why did that work? Um, it shouldn't have. Um, why? So that's one thing. So, um, in 2015, I believe, uh, Tesla.com um, also got hijacked because a person who we don't know yet uh, called AT&T, posed as a Tesla employee, redirected all calls to his AT&T number, uh, used that as an authenticating attribute to Tesla's domain registrar, and redirected Tesla's uh, DNS. And because he did that, he was also able to redirect Tesla's MX records, uh, using which he could redirect all the emails going to the Twitter, official Twitter accounts of Tesla and Elon Musk, and shit posted for a while. Why? For the lulls. <laughs> exactly. So what's the risk metric here? No financial gain. Kind of an identity theft, but not really. Kind of social engineering, again, but not really. 
There are aspects of social engineering, yes. Um, Cloudflare. This is interesting, and this is, yes, yes, yes. I know. So I was in the speaker lounge, and I actually met an employee of Cloudflare who was very interested in what we were talking about. So yes, this was widely publicized. Um, Cloudflare CEO Matthew Prince's pri uh, personal Gmail account got hacked. How um, combination of social engineering and a vulnerability in Google two-factor authentication workflow? I will tell you why. So, um, so yes, his private email was compromised by uh, answering random security questions through uh, someone obtaining his docs on somewhere, um, through which was connected to his work uh, Google Apps account for which, for which he was the admin for the Cloudflare. Um, and because um, he was an admin, the, and they did the password recovery for the private email, the two-factor authentication for the Google Apps account was disabled. So this was a flaw in Google two-factor authentication, which has since been rectified. But more of these keep popping up, uh, because there was one more which had a cross-site scripting vulnerability, um, and there was um, at least one more which had a uh, authentication, um, app authentication, or session authentication vulnerability, I believe. Uh, I could give you the exact information after the talk if, in case anyone is curious about it. But yes, yeah, so there was a part of it was social engineering, part of it was vulnerability in workflow, and part of it was also unsafe secure practices where um, Cloudflare admins were uh, BCCing themselves to the password recovery email sent to Cloudflare clients just to ensure that the client got the email. But if a malicious attacker was the admin, he will get the same email, which will have the link to the password recovery for the client from which he could recover the password. For chance, uh, DNS was compromised that way, and that was fun. So yes, the target was 4chan, um, but yes, then Matthew Prince got docked, Cloudflare, uh, the entire Cloudflare system got docked. Yes, uh, they realized that this happened, they rectified that in a few hours. They were very transparent about it, they were great about it, but this happened. Um, more fun stuff. The CIA director um, got um, his, uh, a teenage hacking collective got access to a CIA director's personal email and home telephone number and also partial credit card information in 2015. How? They called Verizon, posed as a Verizon employee, gave a fake uh, employee code, which Verizon apparently calls a V code. Um, why that code passed checks, nobody knows. Um, the cynical me says they're not even tracking this stuff. Um, the more optimistic, uh, giving the benefit of doubt me says, um, Maybe they have a log now, audit later policy, which also is not appropriate here. They should have authenticated that in real time. Um, uh, I was just talking to someone about these things, and they said that um, APT now just means advanced persistent teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> because in 2016, exactly one year after this happened and when everyone was up in arms, uh, the same teenage hacking collective um, hacked the White House um, Director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, the Director of National Security, and uh, I believe also the Deputy Director of the FBI and also the Miami PD. Fun. <laughs> Same way, they didn't even like do anything magical and revolutionary. And this was, uh, the CIA Director's case was publicized so widely and people were so outraged about it. Why are these things being rectified? So what is going on here? So you can see part of it is, yes, social engineering, but part of it is also inherent vulnerabilities in systems, and inherent vulnerabilities in policies, inherent vulnerabilities in workflows, inherent vulnerabilities in protocols. How do we define these things? What is this even? <laughs> that is why this shit's not being solved. That is why what worked in 1995 is apparently working in 2013. So yes, it seems very easy to do as an attacker, but it seems harder to defend once you actually get into the nitty gritty of these things. Yes, so I didn't even go into all of these things and you kind of see where I'm going with this, but yes, there's more. I'd be happy to talk about any of these cases in more detail if anyone wants to talk to me later, uh, but in the interest of time, let's just move on. So yes, um, this is another interesting case that I do want to go into detail, uh, just because I can use points from here to like make my uh, explain things later. Um, 
so this is just one of the cases I mentioned here, Matt Honan. Um, he was a Wired reporter um, whose entire digital life got compromised. All for what? His three-letter Twitter handle. All for what? For the lulls. Because an APT, Advanced Persistent Three-Nager, wanted to basically shitpost. Just because. So how did they go about it? Yes, so he went to first Honan's Twitter account, which listed his web page, which listed his personal Gmail address. Um, but then, yes, uh, you need to control that Gmail address. How? Unfortunately, Honan did, uh, did not uh, uh, enable two-factor authentication. But what happens when you don't uh, enable two-factor authentication is if you go to the uh, password recovery page in Gmail, it shows you the secondary email um, uh, the partial secondary email. And if you're a human and not a machine, you can pretty much guess what that is. Any guesses? His name is Matt Honan, and that is M, some dots and N. M Honan. Sorry? M Honan. Like, his name is Matt Honan. Like, yes, that's as simple as it gets. You can just get it in the first try if you know the person. So, OK, so now um, the, the, the person knows what he needs to do. He needs to compromise his Apple account. How, do he, how does he go about it? He starts with Amazon. Yes, this is where it gets interesting. So you call Amazon, generate a random credit card number that you want. Um, all you need to add a new credit card number to an Amazon account is billing address and email, the account email. So it has to be one of these two emails, right? It's either the primary email or the secondary email. He'll try. If he doesn't get through at the first glance, he'll hang up. He'll call back, and he'll try the other email. Two tries, finite, doable. So yes, somehow he added the credit, not somehow. This is exactly how he added the credit card information. So um, then he hung up, calls again. And now what happens? Um, you claim to have lost control of the email associated with your Amazon account, so now you want to add another email, which is the email controlled by you, the malicious person. Yes, I'm a bad person. Um, so how, what do they ask you now? They ask you for, yes, your billing address, and another identifier, which is the financial information, which you just had. So give the whole credit card number for all they care. So yeah, you're basically in. You now have control over Matt Honan's email. Poor thing. So why do you want to do this? Because you log in, and you now have um, information of his real credit card, uh, last four digits of his real credit cards, which you then use to call Apple and authenticate yourself as Matt Honan, and get a temporary password on phone, and get access to his me.com email. So, and then what did the teenager do? Basically wiped all of his devices just so that he couldn't get back in. And I was talking about this yesterday at a, a mixer to another person who was telling me that, um, this didn't happen in Honan's case, but he was telling me that there's a new kind of attacks where people are uh, holding your Apple devices for ransom, um, because if not, they will wipe them. So yes, it, exactly this is how, fun. So um, yes, now he has control of Honan's secondary uh, email. He can log in, whatever, got a temporary password. And now he'll use that to control his primary Gmail address. Because yes, goes to password recovery, does recovery, gets it to the email that he now controls. Um, and then he now has information to pretty much everything. Banks, Twitter, Facebook. He's a reporter, so all of his high profile contacts you name it. But what did the person do? Shit posted on Twitter. Didn't touch his accounts, didn't buy shit on Amazon, didn't do nothing. Uh, just shit posted on Twitter for a while. For kicks and giggles. For the lulls. Yes. So how do you do risk analysis here? What, is, what according to you now is a high value target? Verizon account? Comcast account? The CIA director was hacked that way. So how do you associate risk? What's your um, probabilities now when you're trying to engineer this? That's why it gets complicated. So even if, given that you even have a mechanism to like sort this out and engineer that, we don't. That's a different story. We, I'm trying to get there. So yes, and yes, all of these things go on. But um, I wanted to have some fun. 
Um, so I tried some shit, and shit worked. Shit that shouldn't work worked. I tweet stormed, ranted so many times, told them every time things went wrong, why they went wrong, and how they shouldn't go wrong. But I don't know. They're not. They don't seem to be doing anything about this. Why will? Yes, we'll get into the whole motivations and that in the next slide. But what did I do? Um, so yes, Amazon claims that this thing that happened doesn't happen anymore. And yes, it doesn't happen. I did check. Um, but I called Nordstrom, which is almost like calling Amazon. Uh, what did I do? I just called them with the number um, on file for the account, A account. I did it to myself, but I could do it to any of you. Uh, so be nice to me, I guess. Um, <laughs> So um, I just called them with uh, the phone number on file, and they're like, hi, Vanita, what can we do for you today? Didn't ask my billing address, didn't ask me to verify myself, like didn't care who I was, just cared. I mean, I called, a person called with a number, which is easily spoofable. Even a teenager, yes, could do it. Um, what did I do? I redirected a package I sent to myself. And what did they ask me? Zilch, just the new address that I wanted to redirect the package to. So while we're at it, can we also please uh, update my address to this new address that we're redirecting the package? Yes, they did it. And while we're at it, can we also change uh, the phone number associated with this account? Kind of, yes. And while we're at it, can we also um, change the email address associated with this account? So yeah, I was just pushing to see how far I can go get away with. And that's when they started asking me questions. <laughs> so that's when I hung up. But then I called back. No, 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 it's not over. I called back. So now what do I have? I have my other phone number that I control. I have this new address um, that, again, I know. Now the old address is irrelevant because address on file is now my new address. And I just changed my email. Because I know my zip code, I know the email, the old email, I know my new billing address. So yeah, I basically owned my own Nordstrom account. Um, whereas I could own yours too, so yes, be nice to me. Um, so yeah, that was fun. Um, and then yes, eBay. So when, when we like go back to this uh, case, yes, uh, in the case of at n, because that was a single letter Twitter handle, he was offered as much as 50 grand for his Twitter handle. Um, yes, and at JB, he was offered almost 500 grand, probably by Justin Bieber fans, but uh, let's not get there, let's not judge. They're nice people, or not. Um, so yes, um, these are worth money. Um, so what happened at at N? At N got compromised eventually. Obviously, yes, uh, there's enough motivation there. Um, Someone impersonated, like in the case of Verizon, where they impersonated with a fake V code, which somehow passed. They called PayPal, uh, impersonated themselves as a PayPal employee, got the last four digits of the customer, basically just got all the customer information, um, and then used that to call GoDaddy and, um, yeah, fun, yeah, uh, asked uh, for, basically used that to uh, authenticate. But wait. PayPal uh, takes the last four digits of your credit card, and GoDaddy does the last six digits. So you don't know the next two digits. So what did the attacker do? He just guessed. And they let him guess. Because why? Uh, he claimed that he lost the card, um, which he used to register this, so now he doesn't remember. So a very empathetic customer service person let him guess the thing. So I wanted to see whether this is really true. Uh, because that for me sounded very insecure and uh, common sense dictates that you shouldn't let people guess financial information because whatever. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I mean, if it was the real person, he would at least have this number, even if he lost the card, he would at least have this number on some email statement or something, or he could even get it from his bank, whatever. So clearly it's not the person you're, you need to be talking to, but. Uh, because you want to sell crap, um, you value my privacy less than you value your profit. Great. So yes, I called a bunch of people and saw how much I could get away with guessing. And what do you know? And yes, I did get away uh, uh, with guessing with a bunch of other things, but that's not interesting. What's more interesting is they let me guess my own birth year because I claimed I, I forgot, <laughs> apparently forgot the year I was born. Fun. Yeah, isn't that fun? Would you, I mean, before I tried this, I didn't even think 
things were this bad. <laughs> no, when I told it, so this was a part of my thesis. So when I was telling my advisor what I did that day, he was like, are you kidding me? And then he goes and tells to like all these people he met, like, I did not know things were this bad. I'm like, yes, Sergey, I did not know things were this bad. So yes, it's scary. And AT&T, oh my god, don't even get me started on that. I can go on for the rest of the, but no. I compromised my own AT&T account at least four times <laughs> in different ways, not the same thing. Uh, which is why I don't know what they're up to. I don't know what their playbook is because apparently they have no playbook. Monopolies are yeah, and Kevin Mitnick's AT&T account also got hacked, I believe. He even filed a case on that. Yeah, that was fun, and this was a while back. And then now very recently, um, not exactly AT&T, um, but the FTC uh, chief technologist Lori Craner's um, phones um, were, uh, uh, phone account, like mobile phone account was um, compromised because someone claiming to be her uh, went with a fake ID, got a bunch of fancy iPhones, and just left. And then the real Lori Craner's phones just got disabled. Same, uh, similar thing happened to Duray Mackison, uh, the Black Lives Matter activist. Yeah, so um, this is not a one-off thing. Um, this has been happening over the years, again, uh, as we discussed, historically bad stuff. Um, why? I don't know. I tried telling them, but all the response I got was, please don't worry, we will never give your PII to anyone who cannot verify themselves. But I just told you how a person who is not me can verify themselves. They didn't get it. I spent 20 minutes on the call, then I got frustrated, and then I just tweet stormed. Yeah, well. So, yeah. So, I don't even know what their playbook is. So, I can't tell you the exact algorithm that I used or the exact steps I followed because uh, I didn't even need to do stuff. I just sweet talked them. Not, I mean, I don't sweet talk. Look at me. I'm a bad person. I just told you. I'm not even a charming person. And then they even accepted like what I said. So, okay, whatever. So yes, why do these things happen? Bunch of things. I can talk in detail about, not talk, rant, in detail about each of these things until whenever. But um, in the interest of time, um, the power imbalance is what uh, we briefly talk, I briefly talked about, I touched upon a little earlier as to the value, their profit, um, more than they value our privacy. There is no tangible value on privacy. And that's another problem even with the law. Proving harm when a person's privacy is compromised is much difficult. And the bar is unfairly higher than proving harm, but like in terms of financial harm or physical harm. So um, I think Ryan Kahlo, um, uh, wrote a, a couple of really good, a uh, lot of review papers on this topic. Um, and yes, um, using namespaces and personally uh, identifying information as authentication attributes. Ever, so the whole purpose of an email or a phone number is for people to give it to public to contact you. So why are you using public information to authenticate individuals which you're somehow assuming that it's like safe or secretive enough to authenticate individuals. That's stupid. Why are we doing it? Nobody knows. It's just how it's done. And there's no better mechanism now. So let's just go with what worked in the 60s or the 90s or whatever. Um, so yes, the validity and vulnerability of whose data. Yeah, this is another interesting thing that I pick on quite occasionally. A lot of times, um, yeah, don't even bother going to my website and uh, who is uh, looking me up on who is, like, it's hidden. I opted for the privacy thing. But most people don't. Um, so billing address, one apparently primary uh, authenticating attribute in a lot of these services. I can just get it through uh, going to your who's account. Um, and accountability of domain registrars, yes. So this is something I previously said I would touch upon, yes. So who's liable? You just get a fax and then you don't even verify and then you just 
transfer ownership or in at n's case godaddy let them guess didn't even check with at n and just transferred the ownership of his domain to an attacker who then held that up for ransom and wanted his twitter handle fun so there's a legal aspects associated with as i said uh, proving harm uh, for loss of privacy and legally. The law hasn't quite caught up with um, the technology. We all know that. And yes, there's some game theory and economics aspects here, like power imbalances and the whole economic aspects of services versus actors. And there's also some um, risk metrics associated, as in how do you um, figure out what's a high value target anymore? Like your Comcast, like you wouldn't think like people would have anything to do with your Comcast, but the CIA director was um, hacked with his Verizon account, and uh, I believe the director of national intelligence or uh, OSTP, one of those, was hacked with Comcast. And what happened? They just sent an email to his wife, posing as him, saying, "Honey, can you please give me the password to your Comcast account?" And she did. <laughs> I am not kidding. I cannot make this stuff up. Um, I have news articles that I can quote. Um, as I said, if anyone wants more information or whatever uh, citations for whatever I just talked, feel free to meet me later. I'll give you all of this. So, yeah, things are fucked up. <laughs> Which is why we didn't solve it. So, yes, um, some of the things we talked about are immediately doable, like how do we define this problem, uh, making standards, and some of them are fairly more difficult doable but still fairly more difficult so i don't say they're impossible so from left to right i ordered them in the degree of tractability or uh, intractability so the ones in red are fairly doable yes we will now define the problem i will tell you how i define this problem um, i will tell you how we can visualize this problem as in what is it social engineering identity theft um, financially motivated crimes what is this now and the whole database issue that I'm talking about where no database, no reliable database, no database exists, even if it exists, would that be reliable? Who will be governing it? What privacy laws apply? What information can be got? That's a whole different can of forms. So, but yes, those are doable. Those are within our hands as engineers. We can engineer the crap out of those. But the ones in um, yellow slash orange-ish, yellow, whatever that color is, um, they're fairly, um, less tractable. There's, again, still doable, uh, but fairly harder. Uh, there, we have to account for um, the whole economic motivation of it, like the whole uh, economic slash game theory slash risk metrics that I've talked about. And hard to detect, and hard to detect because, let's say this person got into Matt Honan's account and did nothing, didn't wipe his uh, Apple devices, didn't shit post on Twitter. He is a reporter. Um, let's say it's Glenn Greenwald, and this happened to Glenn Greenwald, and he was talking to Snowden. Fun. No. So um, they're hard to detect because technically no one is breaking anything. The inherent insecurities that exist in protocols that are already in place, which from the services, service providers and appear, everything is fine like for AT, for example AT&T don't worry we will not give your PI to anyone who is not you but how do you know it's not me if they give you the information so that's why they're hard to detect so I mean I hope um, this particular point I'm making it clear because as I said I had to stay on phone for 20 minutes with multiple people at AT&T telling them precisely why they cannot say it's not me and they still didn't get it so yes, so yes, these are also fairly doable. We can come up with standards. Uh, we can um, companies. Uh, we can the economic motivation. Uh, if companies see that customers are losing trust, and if we call them out, um, like I am doing right now, um, and Kevin Mitnick did by filing a case in a court of law, but apparently nothing was done. Um, still, yes, doable. But the ones in blue. Um, yeah, I don't even want to open those kind of forms right now. I can't change the law right now. Yes, technically we can. A um, lot of effort. I'm lazy. Um, Cross-platform, yes, all of these um, service providers. Cross-domain, healthcare, energy, tech, uh, service industry, consumer goods, um, and cross-service. Yes, Apple, Amazon, Nordstrom, Neiman Marcus. Um, 
you can't ask all these people to follow one thing you said, which is why I'm not saying that. That's not my solution. Which is also why this is intractable, and no one's really, um, really, really looked into it. So yes, that's why what worked in 1995 works, apparently works in 2013. And that's why HD Moore says people are hacking like it's the 60s. So yes, this is a problem space. And as you can see, it's not a formatting issue. It's just as chaotic. There's law, there's authentication, and then there's ICANN policies, where ICANN is pretty much the di has sole dictatorship over the crappy policies that it makes. And the validity of the who is data, like firstly, um, yeah, why are we um, using billing address as a private attribute when it's universally known that billing address technically can be made uh, or is a public attribute in a who's domain for like a lot of people these days when everyone has services online. I mean, quick poll, who here has a website? Yeah, almost all of us. Uh, quick poll, who here has online presence? Right? That's my point. These are obvious things. Why aren't people doing anything about it? I mean, they're trying. Yes, and I'm telling you exactly why this is hard. So yes, that's chaotic. But so this is um, this, professor, this adjunct professor called Charles Palmer, um, who is also the CTO of Security and Privacy at IBM Research, um, teaches a course at Dartmouth, uh, Security and Privacy. He has a famous line in one of his uh, first classes. There are enablers in security, and then there are disablers. Figure out what you want to be, and then do the assignments from, take it from there, basically. So all of what I spoke right now is basically me being a disabler. Yes, I broke into stuff. I'm complaining about stuff. I'm whining about stuff. I'm ranting about stuff. But yes, what am I doing about it now? As an engineer, what can we, uh, what am I doing, and what can we do? So yes, we see there are, a couple of common threads, again, at a very high level. And yes, we will get into detail on this later. Um, there, we see that these are a result of protocol failures. In the case of um, Amazon, for example, um, they literally followed a series of steps which just left open a wide gaping vulnerability which the attacker worked to his or her advantage. And even in the case of Cloudflare, that was what happened. Even in the case of Nordstrom, that was what happened. So when you think about it this way, you don't need to care whether the vulnerability came up because of a flaw in the system or a flaw in the workflow or because someone was charming enough to sweet talk your customer service. You don't need to care. You just need to make a protocol that doesn't leave these holes open. For example, in very trivial example, in Verizon's case, if they had an interface that checked for an employee's V code in real time, that hack wouldn't have gone further. And in Nordstrom's case, um, if they had um, if they had checked um, another attribute other than just a phone number, which could be easily spoofed, I couldn't have gone much further if I were not me. I, I mean, for each case, I could tell you exactly where those fail. As I said, if you want me to get into more detail, yes, in the interest of time, uh, I'm going a little fast. But yes, please uh, talk to me later. So what are the common threats? These are protocol failures. And in almost all the cases, the attacker exploited secondary authentication mechanisms. Like they either forgot their passwords, or they either forgot their security questions, or I, they either uh, wanted to do something secondary, like change an ownership, or like do something. So secondary authentication mechanisms, by default, cannot be as strong as primary authentication mechanisms, because we go to secondary authentication mechanisms only when we cannot fulfill the requirements of the primary authentication mechanisms. Uh, very simply put, let's say you're traveling abroad and you don't have access to your phone, uh, phone service, and then you have a two-factor authentication and you will not get the code, code nav because you're in Paris. So maybe temporarily you will use a one-time uh, uh, 
token, authentication token uh, that Gmail gives you. Or if you're not that savvy, maybe you'll just disable two-factor authentication for a week because what's the worst that could happen? Um, yes, so secondary authentication mechanisms by default have inherent insecurity in them. So given this, and given that there are also protocol failures, and given that this is what it happens, how do we go about these things? So, a couple of ways. Until now, we are focused, um, and yes, Matt Blaze makes this argument very beautifully in this uh, paper that he uh, wrote toward a broader view of security protocols. Those who follow me on Twitter probably know about it. I keep ranting about this paper in so many contexts because yes, this is universally relevant. I see this paper that could be applied in so many contexts. Because get this, the dude made a protocol out of ordering wine. Yes, yes, I see that expression and that was the exact expression I had when I first read the paper. I was like, holy shit. I was brain exploding. Because he says, his argument in that paper is that over the years, humans have perfected this request response interaction scenario um, where we figured out through evolution the most, um, or at least um, an optimal uh, or suboptimal, whatever, scenario where one party doesn't lose or one party doesn't have an undue advantage over the others. For example, when you're ordering a wine, you do not pay them unless you get your wine. But if someone's giving you the wine, they will ensure it that you don't leave with a thing. So you have this whole dance that you do where you order, someone brings it, and then like you put your, they get your check, and then you put your credit card, whatever. And he details this as a client-server interaction and shows one way of optimizing this protocol. So what Matt Blaze um, it, um, envisions these protocols as, as primarily defense protocols uh, if that evolved over time. But I didn't see a reason to not flip this on its head and look at it as human scale attack protocols, which these attackers seem to be doing. Again, going back to the Matt Honan case, those series of steps, irrespective of how charming or not charming you are, if you call Amazon and do those steps, irrespective of who you are, that will work. And yes, now they've patched it, I get it, disclaimers and all that. Uh, but yes, I did the same for Nordstrom. So irrespective of who you are, you do the same thing and apparently that will work. So yes, and there are compelling security problems across a wide spectrum areas that do not outwardly involve computers. So yes, these do not outwardly involve computers, but when you think about your first call to Amazon until you hang up, I as an engineer would envision that as a session and you hang, that, hang up and you call again, that for me would be a start of another session. But what's happening here, or what was happening here, and what still is, um, these sessions are stateless, in the sense that one session has no knowledge of the other session. But let's say we made these sessions stateful. We now have more information to connect links, and we can figure out what the attackers figured out, correct? So yes, there is some engineering that could be done here. We just need to figure out how to do it. And um, how people figured out ways around this protocol, because people who made these protocols are not stupid, at least I hope not. Um, so, but then why were teenagers able to get around these, where someone in a company spent time and money and enough QA and testing, I hope, um, to make these protocols. So why were they so easy to break? So that brings us to our last argument. Um, and I will also talk about these two um, later if I have time. Um, but you can read them in the meanwhile. There, um, Sean Smith makes this argument that such vulnerabilities happen due to differential perceptions. Like how you, as a systems designer, would envision the system to work would be very different from how I, as an advanced persistent teenager, would want to break the system, right? I don't care whether that is at the network security level or the application security level or whatever level. I just want to find a hole and I just want to get in. I just want to break stuff. Why? For the lulls, but whatever. So how do you figure out these differential perceptions? Their paper, again, gives a model, uh, a formal model uh, based on semiotic triads. Um, 
proposed a long time back um, to, and uh, yes, over 200 cases to see why this happens and where these triad breaks and how we could avoid these things. I so, sure. I have an outrageous speaker request. Yay! I didn't get the time, so it might, might not sit too well. It's That's like, fine. Kind of heavy. Thank you. You're going to have to play the model with the book on the head and like not turn too hard either way. <laughs> yeah, some context there. Um, yeah, this is the first time I'm speaking at any con, um, so I was like a little nervous, so I just said, let's all wear tiaras and be goofy and then just give our talks. So I started this hashtag tiarasec on Twitter, which somehow just took off. And yes, I will also be judging the tiara con, tiara contest at tiara con. So if you guys are around, feel free to come. It'll be fun. So yes, um, moving on. So given that we now know these things and given that we now have this knowledge and we can we can now see that these things could be engineered a certain way all that's left to figure out now and yes that's not trivial but yes uh, from a theoretical standpoint um, we need to figure out how to order this information in a way that we could use formal engineering techniques uh, or computer science algorithms, or machine learning algorithms, or pattern recognition algorithms, or natural language processing algorithms, or whatever techniques exist in engineering to solve this problem. So what do we do? Yes, we discussed that there were a few common threats. So um, when you think of these things, they're all names like email address, some um, Twitter handles, or like your billing address. So they're, they're kind of identifiers in a context, in a space, which is exactly what namespace is. So we don't need to care uh, what platform or what domain or what service this is at. We, we just need to care, um, look at them as namespaces now. So now, now it, it doesn't matter like who the service provider is, what domain it is on, we can still solve for it. So yes, look at them as namespace compromises. Yes, 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 I know, it's cool. Um, and then human interactions, um, client, server, uh, yeah, we, yes, this would be obvious by now because of the way I narrated it. Human interactions are basically request response scenarios, client server interactions. Um, then yes, visualize these in terms of authentication attributes because all of these uh, namespaces, whatever thingies, so-called, whatever, are just being used for authentication, right? Things that shouldn't be used for authentication, like emails and phone numbers, are still being used, yes. Uh, we complained about that, but yes, they're being used. So given this information, we now have our points of commonalities enough to structure the problem a certain way. So when you look at it, what's your attack surface? Um, you literally have two entities, the service and the client. And within the client, you have the malicious client. For the sake of simplifying terminology, let's just call them attacker and victim. Yeah, there are no users in the system anymore. You gotta pick a side. Either you're an attacker or you're the victim. You can't be in between. So yes, and then what do these actors in the system do? They perform actions like reset passwords or call or request or whatever. And then um, yes, and your attack surface has this obvious authentication attributes that we've been harping on about, which shouldn't be used for authentication, uh, like your PII, your financial information, your contact information, and knowledge, like your um, security questions, passwords, one-time passwords, pins, codes, whatever. So um, now that we have this structured, how did I derive um, the whole engineering thing that I'm talking about? Yes, so this is the engineering part. Um, the not so good part is, yes, we still don't have a very reliable um, uh, database for this. Uh, we don't have any database, and yes, as I said, even if we do have a database, the reliability, the legality of it, um, that's a whole different kind of forms. So what I did was, yes, counted uh, news stories, hacker forums, um, personal blogs of individuals um, who got comp whose namespaces got, com now that I defined it, I can use that term, yes, um, uh, whose namespaces got compromised this way. And I had to manually verify, and this is, um, the whole Metasploit um, exploit I talked about where HD Moore said, so HD Moore tweeted that they got um, uh, hijacked, uh, domain hijacked because of a fax. And later, another PR person from the um, domain registrar 
uh, said that they did not, in fact, get hijacked by a fax, but another employee, uh, one of their employees was a social engineer or something. Uh, less, like, that doesn't make it any better, but sure. Uh, maybe you're trying to save face. I, I personally believe HD more, more than I would believe a random PR person of a uh, uh, domain registrar. So that is why um, this is unreliable. It just based on who you instinctually trust more. Maybe you trust you don't trust HD more, and you trust like a domain registrar better because you believe in the systems and entities and whatever. I don't know. Um, so yeah, that is where the whole database thingy got tricky. But I used my best judgment, and wherever I did that, I marked that with terms and conditions attached and with like all the necessary disclaimers. Uh, yes, and then I had to convert them into, uh, structure them and convert them into request response scenarios, which we just talked about. Um, and then I sanitized and uh, sanitized the data and uh, performed lexical analysis. What I mean by sanitizing, and I do have a slide after the end of my talk, and if we do have time or if people are willing to wait, I can get into that. But what that just means is I removed the stop words like A and B uh, and um, random things like that, and then punctuation marks. Um, and lexical analysis is mostly, um, uh, it's easier to say it with an example. For example, uh, when you see the word reset, um, you know it's either going to be a security question or a security answer or a password. And that is going to be within two or three words away from when you ask for a reset. I want a password reset. I want to reset the password for my whatever. So when you remove the, like the soft words, it'll be reset and password that you get in your database. So you see these as bigrams and trigrams now, so you now see the engineering part coming out. So yes, um, that's how I did the lexical analysis. And that's how um, I structured my data and derived an ontology. And Rob Graham, who um, conned me into giving this talk, yes, I hope you're watching. <laughs> Uh, he basically just called me out on Twitter and said, hey, your thesis would make a great talk, give a talk. And then a couple of other people, uh, Munin, who's sitting right there, was also privy to this uh, con. They are like, yes, yes, that would be an interesting talk, yes, do it. I'm like, okay. So uh, he says people don't really use the word ontology around here. So what that just means is a way of ordering knowledge. It's not taxonomy, because taxonomy just means I have to give names to it. But names are already given. So I'm just arranging this not already existing knowledge a certain way, which could be engineered. So that's what I derived. And I know you can't really see much, but like that kind of looks like this. So just to give you the scope of what I'm getting at there, I will tell you what they mean. They're the financial information, like knowledge, the contact information, and the PII. And these are the uh, attributes that I derived uh, by using that lexical analysis from the case studies that we just discussed. And I analyzed over 70 or 80 um, individual cases. So um, it's basically like social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, or um, then contact information like text, fax, voice call, um, basically all these key attributes that people use for authentication. So and then, um, so now we know what we, because we got our key stuff and we arranged it a certain way now, so we, we kind of have an idea of like what's important now. So now we know what we require to form a system like this. So, and yes, stateful sessions, that's the most obvious one which I've been harping on about, like, and you probably got tired of that. Um, and then uh, track attributes in authentication request response, because when someone requests you for stuff, there cannot be a lack of response. You shouldn't be able to sweet talk your way out of things by giving a fake employee code. <laughs> Irrespective of how charming you are, the system shouldn't let you do that. So this now feels like it will have um, a whole different um, aspect of human computer interaction, HCI sec. So, Yes, and then track actions, track actors, yes, because, and then, yes, figure out points of compromise, where exactly, as I said, uh, when you have this whole path of how things are going, you will know exactly what combination would leave you wide open. So um, that's session separation, yes, as I said in the Amazon example. Um, you need to know when the previous session ended and when the session started, just so you know what information was done there, which would be potentially could be uh, used to uh, do things in the next session. 
So this is, uh, I can get into detail again in the interest of time. If you want me to talk uh, more detail about anything, like again, uh, please feel free to ask me. But in the interest of time, I'm moving on. But I think you got a sense of what I'm trying to say here. So yes, this is interesting. Because yes, this looks very simple. This looks very stupid. But we just saw why stupid shit works. Something as simple as this is not holding up in the real world, apparently. Which is why I needed to come up and do this. So what does this mean? Like, it's just nothing. It's like the smallest possible um, transaction or like a set of request response scenarios whose integrity shouldn't be violated if stupid shit shouldn't happen. So for example, when someone requests a transaction, uh, and this one requests an authentication information, and what authentication information does this request? In its internal system, it needs to know. So, and this is where engineering the policy comes in, which is what I was talking about earlier. So then, um, authentication requests, and this and this can't not happen. For example, every authentication request should be followed by an authentication response. Uh, that's very simple. Yes, intuitively, but apparently not being enforced. Um, Yes, and then you have to verify the authentication in real time. Not like um, Verizon, where they did not. Um, and then, yes, you respond. So this is exactly um, what Ross Anderson talks about in his paper, Programming Satan's Computer, uh, where he gives three or four uh, steps of cryptographic protocols that shouldn't fail, that seem so obvious, uh, but they fail in real world. Um, so yes, this is not just me. I've not done anything magical and revolutionary. Uh, very simple protocols fail in the real world. And we just need to figure out how to not make them fail. And this is my attempt at that. And yes, as I said, we have this information that we did. Uh, and now we just need to order it and like represent it. So information is coming from various sources. You don't know when it comes to social engineering, when it comes to people. You don't know where they attack you from. You don't know where you're vulnerable. You don't know where loopholes in your policies exist. So maybe you need at least, if not a tool, at least a way to visualize this, even to intuitively know what's going on. Even that is not there right now. I mean, I have an easy job. When zero exists, even point 0.1 is fine. I mean, you can do 100% tomorrow, that's fine. But I'm saying the zero, and maybe this is 1%, maybe not 100, but yes. So yes, and that's not uh, an error. It's intentional. I just gave you a snapshot of how um, this uh, gra representation I came up with looks. So all the external information, like for example, if I uh, doxed you or if I looked you up on a Whois uh, database, uh, that will all come here. And every actor is defined. And you're tracking every authentication attribute um, that is being uh, used in that transaction. And what are those authentication attributes? Go back to the ontology. We just defined that. That little things that you can't see, where, which I said I just included just to give you the idea of a scope, those are those. So they all come from that. And now it's a summary. And then, yes, there's a session delineation. And you have uh, the next session starts here. So now you have uh, knowledge of previous session. Kind of works, I think. Um, yes, so if this was so easy, why isn't it done? Yes, it's not easy. Um, and there's no tool yet. And also current tools, they do exist some semantic solvers like the Z3 prover uh, and a couple of other tools, um, which um, work on the principle of satisfiability modular theory, um, which could be applied to this problem. Um, but um, we don't know whether the granularity of what we want works with the granularity of what the tool does. And if not, it's not that hard to make new tools for this, provided people are convinced about this. And how would people be convinced about it? Maybe I should like, come give a talk, which I'm doing right now. So yes. Um, what, what about formal modeling? What about uh, tool compatibility? So yes, these are the things that, um, because we just started out with this, we need to like, look into it further. And future work. Um, all the limitations are potential for future work. <laughs> um, so yes, formal viability and analysis. Why aren't we able to visualize attacks? Um, this is my last slide. I know I'm over time. Uh, why aren't we able to visualize the attacks that happened in 1995, which are happening now? Uh, because we don't have something like this 
to at least intuitively see what is going on. So yes, we now have it. So we can go from here somewhere and maybe do more formal stuff and do more math. Um, as I, I gave my disclaimer right here, uh, I should be exempt from doing math um, right now. So yes, um, we can do um, at least retrospective attack analysis is also valuable here. In which case, we don't even need to predict and prevent attacks. We just, we can at least ensure that whatever happened, like when the CIA director got hacked in 2015, the director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy of the White House will not get hacked the same way by the same hacking collective the very next year. At least we can do that much if we have a system in place like this. So uh, that's the USP. I mean, I'm not saying I've solved for world peace. I'm saying I'm giving at least something where nothing exists. So um, yes, and defining risk metrics. As I said, how do we even define what's a high value target for us anymore? At Matt? No. My Comcast account? No. But yes, because. So, and so that's a whole different kind of worms where um, you use game theory, um, risk analysis, risk assessment, and potentially use machine learning um, to maybe even predict risk. So there's a bunch of ways you could go about it. As in, it's a separate problem in itself. This is a separate problem in itself. And tool development is a separate problem in itself. But these are now doable because, yes, we just discussed how we can structure this information and what this is even right now. So yes, any questions? Actually, yes, please. Sorry to, sorry to I'm happy to stay if people are happy to stay. Okay, cool. All right. Okay. Yes, um, please. Well, actually, we're going to go Sorry, so you talked about the victim, the attacker, and the services, right? Correct. So as a victim, what can I do to be less of a victim? That's a great question. And <laughs> no, no, no. That's honestly a great question. Because let's say you now have a tool um, that could give you um, these kinds of information. Let's say you input these attributes and you name your service, like say Amazon or Apple. It's public knowledge as to what attributes they take, correct? Because when we saw from Matt Honan's case, you know Amazon asks for billing, uh, billing information and uh, email account in the first pass. But, but it, it does go ab above that though, because like, I haven't answered your question yet. No, so let me answer my question, your question, and then if you have another question, I will be happy to answer that. So yes, if you have a tool that way, and if you input your service and the authentication attributes that uh, this tool, that service would take, and you can do that as a victim, you can do that across services, which will then show you what information is private. The, which this service considers private, which another service potentially considers public. And you as a victim, even the, if the service doesn't do anything about it, can figure out where you're vulnerable and maybe mitigate that. For example, in Matt Conan's case, he probably wouldn't have daisy chained his accounts that way if he knew about this. So that, I believe, answers your first question. So yes. That, that, that's a good answer. But what, what I was hoping to drive to is like, can I force Amazon to ask me a password? Can I force them to go outside my policy? On some, some places you can. This is also a great can. question, which is why I needed to answer your first question to get here. Yes, great. No, seriously, these are the questions I was expecting. And I don't know who you are, but I like you. So that, for me, what you just asked, boils down to a protocol slash policy plus an interface problem. Because as I said, irrespective of how charming an attacker is, he shouldn't be able to sweet talk his way without giving an authentication response. So let's say the interface doesn't show the customer service executive what the answer is, but if there, I'm just giving a trivial example here, but if there exists an interface where the customer service representative inputs whatever a person claiming to be the legitimate user says, 
then only then it will go to the next step. So you cannot guess. They, they shouldn't be able to let you guess. So that is one way of going around what you just said. There are other ways. As I said, this would be a very good problem for HCI sec. Um, and there are multiple ways you can uh, implement that. And yes, if you have a system like this in place, we can make making tools is purely dependent on context. And we can make tools based on context. And I just gave one context. So this is an interesting talk, but I come from a risk background. Great. Um, have you ever done a risk assessment before? Not very. So as I said, I'm a computer science engineer, but I did look, uh, read up enough about it for us to, to intelligently at least so talk about it on a basic level. So I've done them for clients before, and they hate them. They, these are companies. These are big companies. Right. They have like that much no, I knew. They have known threats and things like this. And I'm looking at this, and I'm going, my mom would have a stroke before she would ever do something like this because it's so complicated. It's, it's something that involves a tremendous amount of, of you know, analysis over people's lives. And these are people who, for the most part, are I agree. technical. No, I agree. So I'm so not in saying- in this room, it makes sense. No, no, no. I totally I agree with you. And which is why I'm talking to people in this room because now they will go back to the companies that you speak of and the service providers might see value in it so that your mom doesn't need to do it. So my whole point here is, as a tech savvy user, yes, you can still apply this. But technically, users shouldn't, be, shouldn't need to. You should make protocols and policies better than what you're currently doing. And as a company, if you probably look into stuff like this, you could make better protocols where your mom doesn't need to do the things that the company should be doing. So the, 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 the problem, the quagmire that you run into, though, is, is it's, it's a trust issue, for one. And it's also an information issue. There's an information black box between companies. So information. So the companies themselves, Amazon doesn't know what Apple makes public. Apple doesn't know what no, eBay but, makes but public. No, but they do. That's my point. So how did the attacker know? When you ask for these, um, how did I know? I just called them and said, look, I'm logged out. Tell me. And you will know what attributes they use. So they should share. They, they should don't. share. But they they sh don't. Even if they don't share, it is, it is not difficult to figure out. I do have a question for you. Sure. Um, another one slightly from a risk background. I'm curious as to whether you're aware of any um, related research um, whereby you could combine this work with uh, a risk assessment that shows, say, the annualized loss expectancy of any particular. That was, yes, no, no. no. Uh, please finish your question, but I see where you're going. Please finish. Any particular thing, because you propose so many different mitigations here, and they all seem to be ones that have the potential to actually be totally effective. Um, are you able to, first off, break it down into individual actions that a company might take? And second of all, is the information even out there for you to be able to yes. estimate loss expectancy? Yes. Yes. So see, this was the exact questions I ran into when I was doing this stuff. So my primary... Um, contribution as a computer science engineer was this part, where I ran a bunch of algorithms, machine learning, natural language processing, pattern recognition stuff, mined data, like figured out like what needed to be done. The next um, step, though, and I did go uh, to business school just because of what you said. I mean, I knew my formal knowledge as a computer science background person wasn't enough, so I just went to business school to study risk assessment. I mean, among other things, yes. Um, and that would be the next thing I would want to do. So I now identified these problems. So as I said, when I talked about these, this, each one is a problem in itself. And it's not even a sub-problem. It's a total legit problem in itself. And that is highly impossible for a person to do in a period of one year. But yes, this would be my future work, or whoever is working, uh, to look more into defining risk metrics, as you just said. Uh, no, I mean, I'm so glad people are asking all the right questions because they totally tie into what everything I wanted to talk about. So, yeah, that is a totally uh, legitimate area that I would want to work on, uh, on this in the future. Awesome. Any other questions? Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Excellent, first of all. All right, thank you.